in the spring of 1918, he looked forward to one day publishing a book of poems and roughed out a preface. This book is not about heroes. English poetry is not yet fit to speak of them. Nor is it about deeds or lands, nor anything about glory, honour, might, majesty, dominion or power, except war. Above all, I am not concerned with poetry. My subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. And it's a strange combination of, of intense passion and anger and pity and craftsmanship, you know, just, and just worrying away at words. It's amazing, actually, isn't it? What do you think when you look at these? It's just incredibly moving that the powers in the poetry, of course, but to actually know that this was the paper that his hand touched, that his pen touched, and through the survival of these rather ordinary pieces of paper, it enabled the poems to get printed after his death, and which meant that his voice was able to survive. Owen had created a new vocabulary of war. It was frank and stark and grim, and it was completely at odds with the previously popular thinking of the time. At the start of the war, few Edwardians, basking in the grandeur of the British Empire, had imagined the horror that this new era of mechanised warfare would bring. Many patriotically believed it was right to die for one's country, and writers of the day echoed the sentiment. Famously, there was Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. The lines are still recited at military funerals, but Owen is the poet for the soldier in combat. I'm at Horse Guards Parade to meet Justin Featherstone, who won the military cross in Iraq. Why do you like Wilfred Owen? It's his resonance, resonance of the common soldier. Uh, he speaks a soldier's tongue. You see, lots of people would say that the message that he's giving in many of his poems is a really anti-military one. He's actually saying this is the, the age-old lie, that it is sweet and good to die for your country. But in your profession, you have to, you have to believe that, don't you? At 100%, and with no hint of irony. But he speaks with an honest, um, almost blunt vision of what being a soldier is about. But it, he was equally saying that committing people to what you think is a great Valhalla and, and a great and glorious way to die, actually, the bloke on the back of the cart with his writhing face and his bulging eyes, that is not a glorious way to go. And I think the romanticization of warfare at the time, and even the hymns in inverted commas like Jerusalem, were all pervasive, and his was a reaction to that. By the early summer of 1918, the Allies were losing the Eastern Front and Germany was still occupying vast tracts of Europe. In August, the British Commander-in-Chief, Douglas Haig, directed the start of an offensive along the Western Front in an attempt to force the Germans back. It was the start of the last hundred days of war. The treatment at Craig Lockhart had been so effective that in only a year Owen had recovered. He was past fit for service. His mother was worried for him and his friend Sassoon even threatened to stab him in the leg to prevent him returning. But Owen was determined to go back to the front. Returning would, he thought, give him the authority to speak. As an officer he felt a responsibility to lead his men. As a poet he felt it his role to bear witness to their sufferings and courage. And so, in September 1918, Owen rejoined his old battalion, the 2nd Manchesters. But he wasn't returning to the front, the man he'd been before. Owen, like so many soldiers, realised that the only way to endure was to become numb, desensitised. Happy are men who yet before they are killed can let their veins run cold. Dullness best solves the tease and doubt of shelling and chance's strange arithmetic comes simpler than the reckoning of their shilling. Their hearts remain small drawn. Their senses in some scorching cautery of battle, now long since ironed, can laugh among the dying, unconcerned. The Manchesters were sent here to Joncourt, ready for the final offensive which would smash through the Hindenburg Line and result after four years of war in Allied victory. Now at this point the Hindenburg Line was right up on the skyline there. It was full of artillery emplacements, trenches, machine gun nests and Owen's job was to take his men down this decline 
up over the top of the hill in front of us and then up the hill finally into the Hindenburg line. Soon after they left here, the man next to him was shot in the head. Owen describes cradling him on his shoulder for half an hour. He said, the blood looked and felt like crimson molten steel. The man was stretched off. Owen led his men on, firing his revolver. And at the top of the hill, he single-handedly took a German machine gun post. He was a man transformed. I have been in action for some days. You will guess what has happened when I say I am now commanding the company, and in the line had a boy lance corporal as my sergeant major. With this corporal, who stuck to me and shadowed me like your prayers, I captured scores of prisoners. I only shot one man with my revolver at about 30 yards. The rest I took with a smile. Over three days in the front line, Owen was thrown into the eye of the storm. He'd become a superb soldier, fighting with precision, efficiency and selfless courage. His bravery was recognised. He was awarded the Military Cross. But more than any citation for gallantry, it's the words that Wilfred Owen uses himself when he writes to his mother to describe what happens, which tell us how much he's changed. I have no word to qualify my experiences, except the word sheer. It passed all limits of my abhorrence. I lost all my earthly faculties and fought like an angel. I came out in order to help these boys, directly by leading them as well as an officer can indirectly by watching their sufferings that I may speak of them as well as a pleader can. I have done the first. Wilfred, and more than Wilfred. Four weeks after that extraordinary talk of fighting like an angel, the second Manchesters moved 20 miles towards the village of Ors. The wood here had been completely flattened by artillery bombardment, so Owen and his men needed to find somewhere they could shelter for the night. They sought refuge in a little forester's cottage right at the edge of the wood. Ah, Monsieur le Maire. Jérémy. Bonjour, bonjour. C'est la maison forestière. La maison forestière où le poète Wilfred Owen a passé les derniers jours ici. On peut visiter la cave. On peut la visiter. La cave est là. Ah bon. Merci. October the 31st, 6.15 p.m., 1918. I will call the place from which I'm now writing the smoky cellar of the forester's house. Owen was to spend three days sheltering here. Once he'd found his men rough, vulgar louts. Not any longer. He reassures his mother that he's safe. So thick is the smoke in this cellar that I can hardly see by a candle 12 inches away. On my left, the company commander snores on a bench. At my right hand, Kellett, a delightful servant of A Company in the old days, radiates joy and contentment from pink cheeks and baby eyes. He laughs with a signaller, nothing but a gleam of white teeth and a wheeze of jokes. It is a great life. I am more oblivious than, alas, yourself, dear mother, of the ghastly glimmering of the guns outside and the hollow crashing of the shells. There is no danger down here. Or if any, it will be well over before you read these lines. I hope you are as warm as I am, as serene in your room as I am here. And that you think of me never in bed as resignedly as I think of you always in bed. Of this I am certain. You could not be visited by a band of friends half so fine as surround me here. Ever Wilfred. I find this a very, very, um, a very moving letter because it's the way in which he talks about how happy he is that's so ironic. It was the last letter he ever wrote to his mother, last letter he ever wrote, in fact, that we know of. And he seems to have reached some sort of contentment in this incredibly cramped and smoky environment with what at least 
from the sound of it, at least a dozen men in here in this tiny space and rather oblivious to the dangers which would shortly kill him. The end of the war was now literally days away. Owen's battalion was given the job of crossing this canal, which as you can see is what, 20 meters, and pursuing the retreating Germans on the other side. They were to cross the canal on a series of rather cumbersome cork pontoons which were linked together by bits of chain. It had rained overnight. November the 4th, 1918 dawned misty. At 5.45 in the morning, the whistles blew and the attack began. But the Germans were dug in on the other side and they were dug in with machine guns. They were cut to pieces. Wilfred Owen never made it to the other side. Precisely seven days later, on November the 11th, 1918, the First World War ended. It had taken the lives of young men in almost every village, town and city across the country and in every village, town and city, people poured onto the streets to celebrate the Allied victory. In Shrewsbury, Susan Owen heard the church bells pealing, but at this moment of collective relief and joy, the final irony of Wilfred Owen's story was about to unfold. Susan Owen received the news of her beloved son's death on this Armistice Day, with the crowds cheering just outside her door. During his short life, Wilfred Owen had seen only five of his poems published. But in 1919, he was included in the anthology Wheels, edited by the poet Edith Sitwell, and in 1920, she put together a small collection of his poems with an introduction by Siegfried Sassoon. But it wasn't until the 1960s that Owen's poetry really gained popularity. His unflinching depiction of war spoke powerfully to the protest generation. But these poems speak to every generation which chooses to listen. It seems to me that these beautifully tended war cemeteries tell something of a lie. With their immaculately straight ranks and their uniform headstones, they seem to suggest that all soldiers are the same. And they're not. Some of them were tall, some were short, some were fat, some were thin, some were sporty, some were bookish. Some probably were fearless, and many were utterly terrified. And what Owen does is to enable us to understand that war is about more than the strategies of generals or the manufactured animosity of politicians. His lasting memorial is to enable us to understand the human experience of war. In short, the pity of war. <laughs>